Hi, I'm Tommy, and welcome to Through the Lens. So I thought I'd start a little series on my YouTube channel where I talk about some of the film cameras in my collection. I've been collecting for about three years now. As you can see up here, I've got quite a few cameras and that's about like not even half of them. So I might as well start with one of my personal favorite cameras, the Argus C3. Let's get into it. So the Argus C3 was produced from 1939 to 1966 by the Argus Camera Company out of Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is my home state. And throughout all those years, the camera didn't really change. This one's kind of fancy. It's got the flash on it and a wide angle lens and a wide angle viewfinder. We'll take a look at the base model that you would get in a minute, but it really remained unchanged throughout the whole run of the camera. The only thing that really changed was a couple minor features that were added or removed and some superficial details of the camera but as you can see it's very blocky it was known as the brick because you know it looks like a brick and it's not the most ergonomic camera in the world but i don't really mind i enjoy it i enjoy taking pictures of this little camera it's probably one of my favorite cameras in my collection so let's take a closer look and i'll show you how to use it all right, I'm gonna show you how to use this camera. Let me just take this one away. And this is what you would get back in the day when you bought this camera, if you decided to buy the case. You can see right there, top grain cowhide made in the USA. And it just comes off by snapping that, folding it down, and there's your camera. And you can snap off the front too, if you like, like that. I usually do, so I can have it over my neck like that and I can just bring it up if I want to take a picture. So unscrew this and let's pop it out. So a quick overview of the features on this camera. It is a rangefinder camera so that means there are two viewfinders. You look through this viewfinder to focus and you look through this viewfinder to compose your shot and actually take the picture. And you adjust your focus by spinning this gear right here. It's a little bit stiff on this one. On my other one, it's not that stiff, but just play with it. It'll get looser with time. But you can see the numbers printed on here. It goes three feet, three and a half feet, four, and so on until it gets to 100 and infinity. And when you look through the rangefinder viewfinder, you'll see that there are two images that are disjointed. And as you turn the focus knob, the focus gear, I should say, those images will start to line up. And once they're lined up, that means you're in focus. And then when you're in focus, you switch from looking through the rangefinder to the actual viewfinder. You take this lever right here, pull it down, that cocks the shutter, and this is the shutter release button, and you take the picture. Now, to set the aperture, if you look on the lens of the camera, it's very easy. It just has the aperture markings right there, F16, all the way up to f3.5. This knob right here is the shutter speed knob. It goes from a uh, tenth of a second to a three hundredth of a second, which isn't very fast, but if it's a sunny day, I always find myself shooting f16, three hundredth of a second on Ilford HP4 Plus, and that works just fine. So when you turn this, you can actually feel it getting tougher to turn until you get to 10, and then it clicks back over to 300. Now, on the top of the camera, there are, it might be hard to see, but there's a letter right there. It says I, and right there it says B. I is for instant, and B is for bulb. So if you plug in your flash, which goes in these ports right here, and you want to take a picture, you change it to bulb, cock your shutter, and the shutter will stay open as long as you hold that button down. Once you release the, bulb, the button, the shutter closes. Now let's rotate that back to instant. This right here is the uh, advanced knob, I, should, I would say. This is what you wind when you want the film to go forward. I'll load up some film in here and I'll show you how to do that. 
This is the rewind knob. So once you're done, you just twist this and it'll rewind the film back into its cartridge. This is the film reminder dial. It just has, it says film speed ASA. ASA is the same as ISO, which is the modern equivalent. And it has from 10 up to 200, but as I said earlier, I shoot 400 speed film, so this is kind of useless for me. But some Argus cameras won't have this. I can get into some of the different variations between the different, uh, oh, I don't want to say models, but versions later. Now, let's load up this camera, and I'll show you how to use it. This film, this roll of film right here has already been exposed numerous times. It's just a test reel, so I don't care if I expose this to the light. But normally, you would pop this in here right like that. The negatives, when you use this, when you go to develop the negatives, it's actually kind of weird compared to the other film cameras that you may use because the film goes in on the opposite side because usually the film goes in here and stretches across there so if you compare these negatives to negatives that you would take on a Pentax K1000 or something like that they would be upside down and backwards but nothing to fear it's just a different orientation it doesn't really matter so you make sure that that pushes up in there nice and firm you pull the film across like this make sure that these little bumps go into the sprocket holes you rotate here until you see that little slit in the post and you just take your film and slot it right into that little slit if I can there we go and you just wind it until it stops and you would close your camera you push this button to close it and open it and you would Cock will ever take your picture, but I wouldn't do that right now because we just exposed the film that's directly in front of the lens. So to advance this, you would take this little hexagonal shaped piece right here, pull it over, turn this a little bit, release, and then keep twisting until the camera automatically stops you from winding anymore. You would set this frame counter to zero, but I didn't feel like it. So just remember to set this to zero before you load film in it. And once you're loaded and ready, you cock it, make sure you're focused, and take the picture. Once you're done with your roll of film, once that reaches 34 or 24 or however many exposures you have on your roll, it's really easy to rewind. All you do is just take this little lever right here, well, knob right here, and just twist it. You don't need to press any buttons or do any levers, just twist it and the frame counter will rotate and the top will rotate until it breaks free from that. I don't want to roll this all the way back into the cassette so I'll open it up and make sure that goes, but when you do it you want to keep, keep winding until all of the film is back into its original cassette. Then you pop it out and you're ready for processing. And that is how you use your Argus C3 very easy to use. That is one of the reasons I love this camera. I've already said it, but that's one of the reasons I love this camera. Very easy to use. So let's get into some of the differences in the variations of these cameras. So immediately, if you look at, look at them like this, you can tell that the frame counter is made out of a different material. This one is made out of metal. This one is made out of Bakelite. The later ones will be made out of Bakelite. This one was made in the late 40s, and this one was made in the mid 40s. So there, you can tell it's an earlier Argus by the material that the frame counter is made out of. Also you can tell an earlier Argus by the uh, finish on the cocking lever. If the finish is just a silver finish with no black paint, then it is one of the earliest Arguses made, I would say, between the, the late 30s and the eh, about 19... 43 or 44. This one was made in 1945. And also the ones from the 50s, you can tell which ones are from the 50s because A, they have an accessory shoe which goes right here. It is a cold shoe so you can't attach a synchronized flash to it unless it's this. And also the, the speeds on the shutter speed dial will be colored and that's an easy way to tell if your camera is from the 50s. Also, 
this film reminder dial on the back. Sometimes it's not there, sometimes it is there. I don't really know the breakdown between the different years it was there and the years that, that it wasn't, but sometimes the numbers on here will also differ, as well as what it's labeled as. Yeah, these two are the same, but sometimes they will be labeled differently. Sometimes it'll say SA, sometimes it'll say Weston film speed instead of just film speed. But they're all superficial changes. This camera remained pretty much identical throughout its entire run. I'd like to get into the history behind these cameras a little bit because there's a very interesting story about a well-known photographer who used one of these cameras. These were very budget cameras. These weren't really for professional photographers, which made them one of the most popular cameras of the 1900s. It sold over two million copies, but there's a photographer whose name is Tony Vaccaro. He was in the army during World War II, and he carried one of these cameras from Europe through Germany and continued shooting with it after the war when Germany was building itself back up. And he captured some very harrowing images right from, from the eyes of the soldier and no glamored up propaganda shots like the, like the uh, embedded cameramen were taking, but it's a very interesting story. There's a documentary about it. I very much encourage you to watch it. It's for free on YouTube. Just search Tony Vaccaro on YouTube and you will find it. I've taken this camera right here, minus all the attachments, to a World War II reenactment where I took a few pictures. Those will be on screen right now. And it's not very accurate if you're going to be a Signal Corps photographer or anything like that, but if you are a civilian correspondent, then this is more likely one of the cameras that you would be given or that you would buy for yourself. And it's very dynamic to use, I would say. It focuses very easy and it always produces a very sharp image, although the scanner that I have is a little bit crappy and it might not look very sharp. The physical prints that I have, very sharp images. Even if, you, if you're off on your focus slightly, you can't really tell, and that's what I really like about these cameras. If you're interested in picking up one of these cameras, I actually have an Etsy store. It's Tommy's Camera Shop. There'll be a link down in the description where I am selling these things. I've already sold three of them, and I plan on acquiring more. They go for, if you find them in the right spot, I, I'm going to tell you a little secret. I like to hit estate sales and garage sales and such. That's where I got this one was an estate sale. You can find them for like as low as $20, probably even lower. I got that one for 20 bucks, but I sell them on my Etsy for closer to 35 or 40 because I take them apart and give them a tune up and such. And they're, they're very good cameras if you're just gonna start out shooting film. They're not very expensive in the grand scheme of things and you can they're very simple to use as you already saw but yeah i would very much encourage picking up one of these cameras and let me know if you want to see more videos like this i plan on making them i have cameras up here that i can make some videos on if you have any suggestions leave them in the comments below i'll read and if i have the camera then i'll talk about it thank you we'll see you next time